Fireplace Books. Tonight we are happy to have with us Martin Lee, who has written an extensive social history of marijuana. Some of you may know that Seattle is a very green city. There, is, uh, there are medical marijuana clinics popping up all the time, and HempFest, the largest pro-cannabis rally in the country, was just held this past weekend. It's nice to have Martin here during a time when more sensible drug laws may be just on the horizon. Please welcome Martin Lee. Thank you. Hey. Well, we really could make this more of a conversation. <laughs> It's hard to get me stopped and talking. <laughs> I've grown to like the subject. As I was telling Jerry, my friend, I'm staying with me, said that my, my previous book was like a social history of neo Nazis uh, since World War II. Again, told through characters. And I was commenting, you know, it's really a lot nicer to cover this story. <laughs> Everyone's getting stoned all the time. I wasn't doing that with neo Nazis. You know? <laughs> well, um, okay, so smoke signals. Uh, it's a social history. It really tells a story of how cannabis came to America and what happened when it came here, how it came to be illegal, how people were banded together to fight against its illegality, and uh, how there were various breakthroughs at different times. But told through characters, told through musicians and scientists and doctors and patients and activists. And, and basically what it is, is there's 56 parts to it, and you can say subsections or subchapters, including the if, uh, introduction and conclusion. And there are just 56 stories all spun together with characters that reappear and, and so forth. So it's, um, but when you think about, when I, one thing that really struck me along the way when I was studying cannabis from a, from a point of view of writing about like this history um, and tracing its path there, how it migrated to this country from its origins in the Kush, the region of Central Asia around the, the foothills of the Kush Mountains on mm. either side. That seems to be where the plant first was known. And from there, it spread around. And every place it would go, any region, any culture, any society, any place, once the plant came there, it never left. It would be adopted. It might be a point of controversy later, but it never left the place. But it would from there go on to someplace else. Mm. It would always stay where it came. Which is a really amazing thing. And it mm. suggests there's something very uh, relational about people and the plant. You know, that's important in some way. That the plant always managed to befriend us. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's a story about how the, the plant, like a flame, would leap from one culture to another. It would just keep going and going and going. And, and it came over to the Americas on the slave ships. Mm. Black slaves from Africa uh, had seeds from cannabis that they brought with them, and then they would grow it when they came. Well, first, the uh, first slaves were to South America, actually, by the Portuguese, and uh, the, the names of the cannabis plants, or the, the nicknames. You know, there's so many names for cannabis. I mean, there's like thousands of nicknames for it. But the words initially in South America were the same words from Angola, from the tribes there, and so forth. You know, where the where the, uh, the Came from. So the first character that's introduced in a significant way in the story is Louis Armstrong. And not because that's the point at which the story starts. It actually starts in the beginning, really starts uh, at the beginning of the 19th century in, in terms of becoming, being in the Americas. Um, but Louis Armstrong was a great way to start the story because it's Louis Armstrong, uh, because he was so, so, cannabis was such an important part of his life, uh, because he was so great. and, and um, uh, because also he was the grandchild of a slave, and I wanted to be able to set up how it came, you know, with the seeds from the slaves after telling a strong story. Because at one, I'll read a bit. Uh, what I intended to do was read bits and pieces here uh, from the book. And I'll, I'll read a little bit about the Armstrongs, and you'll see how it works. In terms of, uh, starting the history this way, even though chronologically it doesn't start with that, uh, but it's the first chapter. Let's see. For Armstrong. Cannabis wasn't just a recreational substance. It was a nostrum, a tonic, an essential element of his life. We always looked at pot as sort of a medicine, he stated. Marijuana was part of Satchmo's overall health regimen. He never used hard drugs or pop pills. Preferring to self-medicate with various herbs and home remedies, a custom he learned from his mother, who emphasized the importance of being physics-minded. This practice, involving a mixture of African and Southern folk cures, was instilled in Lewis during his impoverished childhood. His family was too destitute to see a professional doctor, so his mother would go out by the railroad tracks and pick a lot of peppers, grasses, dandelions, etc. 
Armstrong, remember, and she'd bring it home and boil that stuff and give us kids a big dose of it. So what exactly did Satchmo mean when he referred to marijuana as medicine? What, in his case, was cannabis a remedy for? Armstrong said he used reefer to unwind, to relieve stress, to ease the chronic pain of racism. Smoking marijuana helped him deal with the daily humiliation meted out by Jim Crow, white society's relentless, sickening assault on his self-respect. As he told record producer John Hammond, it makes you feel good, man, it relaxes you, makes you forget all the bad things that happened to you. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. But, uh, but uh, what Ralph Ellison wrote this iconic book in American culture, the black novelist, Invisible Man, in, in the 1950s. So in, I pick up talking about it. In the opening pages of Ralph El Ellison's Invisible Man, the nameless narrator lights a reefer and listens to a recording of Louis Armstrong singing, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? That's the name of this section, Black and Blue. A soulful lament that epitomized the plight of African Americans. Armstrong's voice of musk and cinnamon imbues the lyrics with poignant emotion. Ellison's protagonist, absorbing the smoke and sound, is propelled into an eerie reverie, a surreal space, the American dream in black light. To be invisible was not just to lack acknowledgement of the scorn from the pale man, it was the fundamental condition of black people in America. This, if, if you never heard this song, it, it's in the album uh, Sa uh, Satchmo Plays Fats. He did uh, uh, Armstrong's recording of, Louis, uh, of Fats Waller songs. And Fats Waller was a great songwriter. He wrote, wrote the song Black and Blue. And Armstrong played it and sang it. And it just tear your heart out. Anyway, Black and Blue was the centerpiece of Armstrong's performance at an outdoor concert in Accra, Ghana in 1956. More than 100,000 people thronged the city stadium on a sweltering afternoon to hear Satchmo sing this song with such intensity that it brought tears to the eyes of Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana's prime minister, a moment captured on film. Louis Armstrong, the most visible of invisible men, I mean, he was famous the world over, traveled the world over, but this trip to the Gold Coast of West Africa was special. When he saw the women of Ghana, he recognized the face of his own mother. I know it now, I came from here way back, at least my people did, Armstrong asserted. Now I know this is my country too. Uh, the, the prodigal son, the grandchild of a slave, had returned to his ancestral homeland, a land where the ceremonial use of roots and herbs had long been linked to animist spiritual beliefs. A staple of African shamanism, cannabis and other consciousness altering flora were revered as sacred plants that provided access to hidden knowledge and curative powers. I run through for a few paragraphs examples of how uh, cannabis was used medicinally and, and ritually among uh, various tribes in, in throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I'll just pick up from the end of that. In West Africa, from whence Armstrong's ancestors hailed, cannabis was utilized as a treatment for asthma. Um, and then the, this section ends, the roots of jazz and blues extend back through slavery to the collective rhythmic patterns of indigenous tribes in West Africa where cannabis had thrived for centuries. Thrown upon bonfires, marijuana leaves and flowers augmented nocturnal healing rituals with drum circles, dancing and singing that invoked the spirit of the ancestors and thanked them for, for imparting knowledge of this botanical wonder. It was only Natch that Satch, the musical savant and Daga, devotee, Daga was a word for cannabis felt right at home as soon as he set foot on West African soil. After all, he explained, my ancestors came from here and I still have African blood in me. And it was interesting, when I was researching that I thought about it, really it's kind of amazing when you, you know of ja uh, the link between jazz and marijuana later, it's very important. And Armstrong's mm -hmm. one of a slew of jazz greats who had an intimate relationship with Mary Warner, as he would put it. Um, but, it, you know, jazz comes from somewhere. It's rhythmic patterns, and it's been studied by scholars, and they trace it to West Africa for how the drums were beating, and they see the same kind of jazz patterns, and, you know, the basis for jazz and blues. And this is where cannabis was heavily employed ritually and, and, and therapeutically. And so you have this connection between the sound and the, the smoke back in Africa, and then it continues somehow later on. And, of course, Armstrong is the great embodiment of that story. Um, anyway, so another example of a character that I would focus on, it's a, the, not one single character, but the beats. Because when, when you speak of a, a cultural uh, leap, of, of, of cannabis <coughs> leaping from one culture to another, within North America, it leapt from uh, 
uh, Spanish uh, field workers, uh, or Mexican field workers, I should say, into mainstream America, ultimately uh, jazz, black jazz artists, to the beats, the beat writers in the 1950s who, who took, and it was through them that cannabis then leapt into the mainstream of American culture. So uh, there's one section of the book about the beats, uh, focusing on obviously Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, uh, William Burroughs were the key guys. Uh, I'll read you a little bit about that. There's actually a, um, a story that goes along with this. Kerouac, who wrote On the Road, the great beat writer, said he first smoked marijuana and it was given to him by Lester Young, pre the Prez, you know, the great uh, jazz saxophonist, and a person who made saxophone really, uh, and moved it out. I mean, the trumpet was so do dominant because of Louis Armstrong, the saxophonist would play like a trumpet. You know, that was considered the great thing to do with Lester Young. It stepped out and it paved the way for Charlie Parker. So, Kerouac's hanging around as a teenager, hanging around in New York City jazz clubs in, in the mid four, early 40s, and he's somehow or another he gets turned up by Lester Young. That is a perfect flame leaping moment kind of thing of going from one culture to another. And I'll just pick up and read a little bit about. Uh, that the Kerouac's Cabal, you know, the group of beat writers, loved the associational fluidity engendered by cannabis, how it loosened the powers of analogy and unleashed the spoken word. They stayed up all night smoking fat marijuana bombers, listening to jazz, reciting poetry, and confiding their deepest secrets, their hopes and fears in protracted stone rap sessions. Marijuana was a truth drug of sorts for the beats. As beat poet Allen Ginsberg recalled, all that we knew was that we were making sense to each other, you know, talking from heart to heart, and that everybody else around us was talking like some kind of strange lunar robots in business suits. Um, let me jump ahead a little bit. Oh, actually, I'll continue. Kerouac, uh, Ginsburg and Kerouac, along with William S. Burroughs, comprised the core group of beat writers who refused to live according to the rules set by straight society. During the deep freeze of the Cold War, when reflexive obedience to authority was rewarded, they offered a biting critique of America the Beautiful. At a time when few middle-class Americans doubted the, f doubted the fundamental goodness of their society, the Beats railed against the spiritual bankruptcy of consumer culture and the deadening routine of nine to five. At a time of expanding nuclear arsenals and ghoulish strategies of mutually assured destruction, Ginsburg told America, go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. In the same poem, uh, oh, as pro pro pop prohibition became increasingly punitive, in this, uh, he declared in the same poem, I smoke marijuana every chance I can get. In an era when homes across the land, we're talking early 50s now, television just coming in, in an era when homes across the land were sprouting TV antenna that transmitted a relentlessly cheerful and confident message, Ginsburg and his companions felt utterly beat, as in burned out, beaten down, emotionally and psychologically exhausted. The term came from an offhand remark by Kerouac, who despondently told a friend in 1949, I guess, guess you might say we're a beat generation. The word had a dual connotation in keeping with the culture of doubles associated with cannabis. Uh, that's, that's background to that earlier in the book. A beat implied beaten down, and it also meant beautific, to be in the state of beautitude like St. Francis, trying to love all life, Kerouac insisted. It could refer to someone who is beaten up, or upbeat, or both. <laughs> part citified and part pneumatic, the beats were subterraneans, self-selecting outcasts, who became internal exiles. To smoke pot in those days was to take sides, to affiliate with an underground community, a community of the excluded, as Ted Morgan described the beats, a fraternity of the unlike-minded, who were out of sync with the national mood. Uh, the key character in, in terms of the cannabis story is really Ginsburg. I, I followed his time with the Beats into the 1960s, and to my mind, there's no one who embodies more in the 60s in some ways than Allen Ginsberg, at least the portion of it, or a big, an important portion of it, the cultural, political uh, rebel, the, the, the gay rights, the proto-gay rights, well, so many important things. A peace activist all his life, an anti-censorship activist. Um, and he becomes really the first marijuana, or, uh, anti-prohibition activist uh, in a major way. He, he, um, I mean, just to step back, when you look at the cannabis story, and if you thought of it as a movie, in a movie typically a script you have like half, half an hour into it, there's, there's something happens and it throws the plot in a totally d new direction that's surprising, and then like you know, half an hour before it ends, another thing happens and you, it throws the plot in another direction. That's like a classic movie thing. Well, if you apply that to the history of cannabis, the 1960s is the first thing 
you know, that went out in an unexpected direction. Um, and uh, there's a whole chapter on the 60s here, and it, it really, uh, every uh, decade in the book has its own chapter therein, the 90s has two of them, because that's, that's like the, the 60s for the cannabis scene, really, and when things really changed because of the passage of Proposition 215 in California, the beginning of the whole medical marijuana uh, electoral reform movement. And that's the, that's the second thing that spins it off in a different direction and paves the way for what's going on in Seattle now. Really, without 215, I don't think we'll be seeing what's going on down here. Mm -hmm. uh, so those two key points are, are really important. And, and what I do is I try to trace a lineage of, of people who are prominent as, who, became, who emerge as prominent activists in the cannabis scene. Uh, so in terms of, we start with Ginsburg. You remember Pot is Fun? He held that sign up, and then his beard is, you know, is full of snow and stuff. <laughs> Uh, your classic moment, 1970, the first uh, public anti-prohibition demonstration in New York City, 1965. It was actually one earlier in California. Uh, and Ginsburg ended up being involved in the formation of the first legalization group. It was called LIMAR, a legalized marijuana. And it was a very interesting group of people, plus of poets and writers and, uh, from various cities. And, and uh, uh, one, of these fellow, one of these people involved in the scene was guy named Michael Aldrich, still an activist in San Francisco today. And it's from Michael Aldrich, who was a scholar, he got a first PhD in, uh, from a grad, in a graduate school, writing a, a dissertation about hemp and the history of hemp and so on. So he's a serious guy, a great guy. Uh, in a conversation he had one day with a guy named Jack Herrera, before anybody knew who Jack Herrera was, before he became the hemp and the great hemp advocate. Uh, in a conversation, Michael just casually mentioned, you know, you, you, I have these rolling papers made from hemp, the hemp plant. And he said, you mean you can do something with the plant other than smoke it? You can actually, you know, and from, from, from this Lemar lineage, Jack Hare emerges much later, of course. He really emerges in the 80s. Lemar was in the 60s. There's a lot of stuff that happens in between. But just to kind of tease out the connections, and from there, you, you get right down to people who were speaking at Hempfest, like Steve D'Angelo was sort of an acolyte of Jack Herrera. Uh, Steve D'Angelo was a uh, CEO of the biggest dispensary in the world in California. Mm -hmm. We call them dispensaries, not collectives in California, even though they're supposed to be collectives. Um, anyway, so we, we kind of, we, the story fo follows the bouncing ball through the, through the years, through the different periods, and uh, through Jack here. And I'll, I'll read you a couple of paragraphs about Jack, because there's things I learned I, uh, uh, that, uh, it, it, captured, I think, the essence of who he is. All right. Um, anyway, at one point, Jack Herrera, he's already starting to get interested in hemp, and he kind of had a very early version of his book, When the Emperor uh, Has No Clothes, or Wears No Clothes, whatever that book, the title is, you know, important book. But it was a very early version, and it, it was kind of like, you know, loosely from post stamp stuck on it, just so he would go around with this thing. Anyway, he comes to Washington, D.C., because he's hot on the trail of trying to find this film that was made during World War II, Hemp for Victory. It was like a little... You know, booster film, 10 minute, uh, to, to uh, get uh, inspire farmers to grow hemp during World War II because the Philippines had been invaded by the Japanese and uh, the United States lost its rope source, its hemp source, and they really needed it. So uh, there was a film made to that effect, and Jack Herrera wanted to find the film or wanted to confirm. He actually had already had a copy, but he, he wanted to confirm in the National Archives something about this film, some, some details. So it comes to Washington, D.C. Okay. <coughs> Hera was hot on the trail of the U.S. government's World War II propaganda flick, Hemp for Victory, which was referenced in the National Archive. Hera got a hold of the 14-minute black-and-white motivational film and made a duplicate copy for himself. With snatches of Anchors Away and other upbeat songs playing in the background, Hemp for Victory showed images of old glory wafting in the breeze while U.S. troops prepared for battle. American farmers were instructed how and where to plant hemp, how best to harvest it, and the many good reasons for doing so. Hemp for, for light-fired duty hoses, for parachute webbing, for countless uses on ship and shore. Hemp for victory. And this is what's going on in the background. Herrera made a continuous video loop of the film and projected it 24 hours a day at a licensed stall at a, a stone's throw from the Washington Monument, where he set up a mini hemp museum to protest the Smithsonian's omission of hemp from its historical visits, uh, exhibits. So he's sitting outside in this stall 24 hours near the Washington Monument. With, for days on end, this irascible, boisterous fanatic held court near the big obelisk, his beard and hair askew, a latter-day Jeremiah raving about cannabis the savior, while hemp for victory played over and over again in the background. Well, Fortified no. on grass and psychedelics, Herrera was firing on all synaptic cylinders. 
He was in the climb of rhyme, a man possessed. Jack had an almost a messianic ability to influence people, Rick Frommer recalled, as somebody who knew him. He would get high as a kite on acid at the Washington Monument and preach like a messiah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we know. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, another, uh, I mean, if, any, if there's one single character who's the essential character of the story, and there's no one that can be because it's too wide, a, too many, it covers too much ground historically, but it's Dennis Perron in, in, in San Francisco, who's the founder of the first cannabis dispensary, the first medical marijuana dispensary. He founded it before it was legal, it was a civil disobedience, it was direct action. It was in the context of this terrible AIDS situation in San Francisco when people were discovering that cannabis was the only thing to help with nausea and the only, the only thing to help with anorexia and the wasting syndrome and AIDS and the only thing that enabled people to keep the, the, the medicines that came along eventually down. Uh, the, 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 the proteus inhibitors actually did suppress the the virus, but they were so harsh, people, you know, yeah. people would puke all the time. The cannabis was just what they needed for this, and it was that was real. I mean, there were other precedents for for uh, cannabis as medicine that culture midwives use it before in, in the United States from the '60s on. You know. But uh, this was really, really important in terms of what happens historically because uh, Dennis, who was part of the gay community, and so many of his friends are dying, and his lover dies, and he has a dream on the night that he's raided, and his lover's. You know, need in the back by the San Francisco cops. He's got AIDS lesions and stuff. And he has a dream about a, cat, a pot club, public pot club, where, where everyone uh, could, who was sick could come and smoke cannabis and have a, you know, be with each other. And, um, and he, he made the dream a reality. And it, it, uh, a chunk of the book, uh, three sections, a half a chapter, <laughs> is all about how Dennis did this, how the, all this happened in San Francisco, how, how they formed the first pot club. And uh, I'll, just, I'll read a little bit about this. What, this day, what day was that? What time? I mean, um, well, the, 1995 was when the pot. Dennis has a long history as a cannabis activist in San Francisco. He was a major pot dealer, the biggest in the Bay Area since the mid 70s, uh, and he did a lot of things publicly, pushing the envelope. He had a restaurant publicly. People would go to the Castro District, where you get a joint when you order a meal, and people would smoke. You can go up to the supermarket and buy stuff there. And this is going on openly for several years, almost like Amsterdam. It was sort of an early forerunner of what he ended up doing years later in response to what was going on with AIDS. Uh, some of this may sound a little bit like, oh yeah, you know, because of what's going on now. But remember, this is the first. Mm -hmm. This is the one that opened the door to everything that happened. This was unprecedented uh, while it was going on. So patrons lined up, I'm describing the can San Francisco Cannabis Buyers Club, which was now existing on Market Street, a main thoroughfare right by, near the Civic Center. This is smack dab right downtown. San Francisco, because the, the club had the support of the political establishment, the support of the district attorney. It was a very unique constellation of factors that lined up to allow all this to happen. And because it did, it was, it was very important. Okay, patrons lined up at counters to choose from the daily menu of pot specials in, in the club. Smokables, edibles, tinctures, and topicals. Several strains of bud were displayed beneath the sign that uh, read the island, a memento from Perón's first cannabis cafe in the Castro. Uh, wholesome food went for a dollar a plate, etc., etc. Okay, for snacks, uh, a dessert of snacks, the Brownie Mary Bar offered baked goods with a range of potencies. The club also sold hemp clothing and smoking paraphernalia, along with copies of Brownie Mary's marijuana cookbook and Dennis Perone's recipe for social change, which included some homegrown advice. Mix in a big country a magic herb, a blend of people do not separate, and lots of chutzpah. Pour off prohibition, strain out and discard unjust laws, you can use no DEA, whip media into a frenzy, smoke remainder for several days, mm -hmm. serve. <laughs> and so that was the spirit of the club. Okay, the bustling pot dispensary was always crowded on Tuesdays and Thursdays when Perone gave away free bags of marijuana to poor patients, not just people with AIDS, but also those suffering from cancer, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, glaucoma, arthritis, and other degenerative conditions. Nor did Dennis dismiss those suffering from common afflictions just because their pain or disability didn't entail chemo or a wheelchair. The San Francisco's can uh, the Cannabis Buyers Club wasn't only about smoking grass. Marijuana is part of it, but the biggest part of healing is not being alone, said Perone, who intuitively grasped a profound truth that experts over uh, often overlooked in the age of high technology medicine. Social isolation is bad for one's health. Mm -hmm. 
The pot club was therapeutic by design, a setting where wheelchair-bound patients and other chronically indivi ill individuals could hang out, smoke reefer, make new friends, and interact with those who shared their plight. It was a place where people came to laugh for the last time before they died. Mm. Think about that. Amazing what happened there. And really paved the way for, uh, for all that's going on since in, in all the states. And it was because of this, you know, crazy. I mean, Dennis was unstoppable. He, 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 it's not everybody liked working with him, but he was just an amazing guy. He just got it done somehow, and, and, and because he had nothing left to lose, it was that sort of thing. Um, so I tell the story of what happens after 215, how 215 actually came to pass. You know, it was it was not smooth sailing, getting that on the ballot and getting it. And it passed by a wide margin, but what happened behind the scene uh, was really intense and uh, uh, turbulent. And, 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 and it was factionalism and infighting you know, we see it today in Seattle, no, and it continues the same things today in California, yeah. all the same people. <laughs> I don't mean to make like it, like it. These are an amazing heroic group of people really who pulled this off, and Dennis was at the center of it. Um, but the reaction on the part of the government, now that's the interesting thing, and the last, I'd say, 40% of the book ha is told after 215, <coughs> focusing a lot on California, not exclusively, it's not just a California story, it's really a global story, but mainly, mainly the United States. Um, and uh, one thing I get into is documenting how state and local law enforcement were illegally conspiring with the federal government to destroy the law, and that's happening still to the present day. And this has never stopped. And you know, documenting the meetings and who was there and lay it all out, just you know, expose it. Um, what started out, what, what sort of drew me into the story as uh, looking at the law enforcement attacks on medical marijuana scene in San Francisco after 215. That kind of what drew me into the story. I mean, it was pretty nasty stuff here and there, you know. I mean, raiding uh, paraplegics, you know, handcuffing them to beds. And th I mean, you know, insane things that was going on. Uh, it was it was like a uh, very powerful story, just that alone, because it was so morally unequivocal. You know, there was patients who were crippled, and there were cops beating them up. I mean, not, if not literally manhandling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. or, or, or abusing. Yeah. And there's something that was so, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, black and white, and you know, no one could say, well, I don't know, maybe they deserve, you know, it was not, you know, marijuana is controversial, it divides society in a lot of ways. But you can't, this is not, this is beyond that. And that's what drew me into the story. That, you know, I should talk about what's happening to a whole bunch of people in California, particularly not in the big cities like San Francisco necessarily, which became safe havens for, for uh, the cannabis community, and other places too. But in the, in rural California, what they call Red State California, where the counties that voted against Proposition 215, the way out in the boonies, the cops went nuts in these places. And really nasty stuff happened. It wasn't being reported. And that's what drew me into the story initially. Mm -hmm. What I had no idea about, which really blew my mind, and which became a dominant thing for me, it kind of took a different direction in the story, was when I began to learn about the science that was going on in the field of uh, studying about cannabinoids <laughs> compounds in the plant and how they interact with the human nervous system, the brain, the receptors in the body and so forth. This I had no idea about when I got into this, I got into writing a story and, and it completely it was like, wow, you know, and I became, for lack of a better, really infatuated with the science and I don't have the background for it uh, actually, but uh, I, I started attending conferences uh, of science. Now these are not doctors, not patients, these are hardcore scientists, suit and tie guys, not necessarily pat smokers, all from every continent and around the world. They get together from all these different countries and, uh, and they meet once a year and sometimes more than that, but they have an annual conference hosted by the International Cannabinoid Research Society. And they uh, describe the new discoveries they're making in their respective fields of medical science, but a lot of it's just hard science and molecules and what links to what and what new thing is discovered as a result of that. Really, you know, a complicated stuff, um, but mind-blowing. And what, it, the ironic, and as I studied the science and, 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 and started to try to translate what was going on into ways that maybe people could, if I could understand it, at least part of it, then maybe I can help someone else understand. And this became a very important part of the book. That, the, no, the, the notion that, I mean, let's, I'll introduce it this way, we all have something called an endocannabinoid system. Uh, I can't go into it too much now, it, it's too detailed, but the, the idea is that when we went to uh, school, high school, even younger folk, I don't know how old you guys are, how old, recently you were in high school, obviously you're not in high school now, but 
Uh, we learned certain things in biology class. You know, you have a skeletal system and a nervous system and a reproductive system and a muscular system and a circulatory. You know, you learn these basic things you're supposed to know. Well, what scientists discovered starting in the late 80s and going to like the mid 90s, when, and still, they're still discovering, but the basic uh, structure of it uh, over like a seven year period starting in the late 80s was we have, this, we have this whole other system we didn't know about. And it's a system of, for lack of a better term, neurotransmitters, meaning mm. chemicals that uh, uh, you know, uh, ping receptors that cause chemical, biochemical reactions to happen in a cell which sends a message somewhere. They're basically messenger carriers, neurotransmitters carrying. Uh, but what's a un there was something very unique about the cannabinoid neurotransmitter system that's different from all the others and that makes it so that it regulates all the other systems in the body. This was a profound revelation. And it's why uh, cannabis is a remedy for so many different things. I mean, name the things. Is it a lung problem? Is it the gut? Is it the nerve pain? Is it the whatever? Uh, cannabis seems to be right there. It seems to do something good for it. I mean, not everything, but a lot of things. Not so much necessarily infectious diseases, but even there, there's interesting stuff going on. The more chronic illnesses, cancer, and neurodegenerative illnesses, and so forth. And the, this, the study of the endocannabinoid system, forget about the plant for a moment, because actually the endocannabinoid system existed much longer than the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant, 30 million years old. Endocannabinoid system, about 500 million years old. It started evolving with sponges. It's been a through line in animal uh, evolution. It left off insects. They went a different way. They don't have them. You know? uh, but anything with a skeleton, exoskeletons of insects, right? right? Uh, they don't have cannabinoids, uh, endocannabinoids. Anything with a skeleton inside has it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's consistent throughout the world. It means it's really important. It stayed with us. And it seems to be like a guiding thing almost in evolution because uh, just to share a little bit of the mind blowing stuff, in my opinion, my life. what scientists realized was that this endocannabinoid transmission system had worked in a different way from all the other transmission systems. And the way, you know, two nerve endings, you have a synapse that jumps from one nerve to under, you have a chemical that facilitates the message. Mm -hmm. That's the normal way of doing it. Jump from one ner nerve ending to another, if you see, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I should mm -hmm. have a drawing here. Mm -hmm. There to there. And, you, and it might be uh, serotonin facilitating that message, or glutamate, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, any number of uh, dozens of neurotransmitters. Can the cannabinoid transmission goes the other direction and does something totally unique that no other your transmitter system does. It engages in this thing called retrograde signaling, the diaphragm, the scientists said. So it, it, it jumps the other direction. And the, there are the receptors situated on the, before the nerve endings, which kind of turn off and on, or, or I should say turn off generally, but if it's not turning it off, then it's allowing it to be on. The message, if it's firing too much, if you get too stressed out with you know, the stress hormones that are going on there, it, it then turns it down. That's what the endocannabinoid, what's one of its basic functions. And the only other time scientists have ever seen this retrograde signaling happening in an organism is when the nervous system in the brain is forming in the embryo of a mammal. So think about that. So it's involved in the form, the firing of the cannabinoid transmitters are, are involved in, as no other neurotransmitter system, no other messaging system is, in the formation of the brain and the nervous system in the womb of mammals. That's really profound. And it's from there that I believe that the endocannabinoid system gets its neuroprotective aspects because it's one of the main functions to protect neurons. If you're firing too much, wearing something down, you turn it down. That's what it does for all these different uh, physiological systems. But in the, when you think about it, if, a, if the brain and nervous system is forming in an embryo, if it doesn't have some protection while this is going on, something, whatever it is that's doing this transmission, uh, that's guiding this process, it, and that's what they found, that actually guides the formation of the brain cells and their the stem cells and their migration to other, the endocannabinoid system is doing that, I kid you not. This is all documented science, and it's really profound. And it suggests that the kind of healing that goes on when phytocannabinoids hit these receptors, they do the same thing that our, end, our own cannabinoids, we have our own uh, compounds in the brain and the body that uh, uh, do the, basically the same thing that the cannabis, uh, the, the, the phytocannabinoids do. A little milder. They don't bind as strongly as, let's say, THC binds to some of these receptors, but they bind. all the time they're binding. They're, they play a very important role.
body. You know, I can go on and on like this. It's one of my favorite subjects. But this, uh, this is an area that I got deeply interested in. A, mm -hmm. because it validates the medical marijuana experience. Mm -hmm. It explains in so, in so many instances why patients in all these different, well, suffering from all these different conditions, benefit from having the, these receptors activated. Mm -hmm. uh, benefit from retrograde signal. If you got uh, autoimmune is too much immune activity, right? Well, the endocannabinoid system modulates the immune system among all the other systems, so it turns the, uh, just turns the speed down. Too many immune, th you turn it down a little, you don't feel the pain. You know, it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and this has been documented cold by uh, scientists in so many different areas, but generally not with human subjects, with animals, with test tubes, with, you know. But in the case of, uh, I mean, there is human uh, studies going on outside the United States with cannabinoid extracts. This is one particular company, GW Pharmaceuticals in Britain, that's working with an extract called Sativex, mm -hmm. which has half CBD, half THC. I don't know if you know, yeah. everybody knows about CBD. It's the exciting hot thing in cannabinoid uh, medicine these days because it's not a psychoactive compound. It doesn't make people high. And it turns out to have a great medicinal uh, and, and phenomenal it's an impact and, and so there's a lot of excitement about that and it also makes cannabis as a medicine accessible to people who don't like getting high of which there's quite a few people actually mm -hmm. um, who don't like getting high and so it means they can also benefit from cannabinoid therapies um, so that's sort of where things are at today there's a lot going on and <laughs> the political situation is, is turbulent and going in opposite directions and kind of crazy <laughs> but it's happening and, and I think uh, it's here to stay and never left anywhere that it's come to. So it's uh, we have to make our peace with it. Maybe we will sooner or later. I don't know. Uh, I'll probably wrap it up with that. I might, it might be nice to have a conversation. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been a social worker for 20 years with the state, um, and only the last two years they allowed weed for the treatment of pain. That's the only, that was the only thing they're allowed. So Washington State. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I've had it denied so many people over the last 20 years, but. Last two, I've been able to actually let that one go as long as your doctor is right now. So green card's not good enough, but you have primary care. But um, I mean, pain um, is the thing that people go to for a doctor most often, more yes. often than any, anything mm -hmm. else. Yeah. It's strange that uh, with California, see, there was no no uh, restriction on the conditions. It was this brilliant phrase that was included in uh, Proposition 23 for any condition for which cannabis may provide relief. That was. That's what made it. Uh, without that, it, would, it wouldn't have been really what happened. You know, that was a crucial phrase. That was uh, one thing, Dr. Todd and the one thing contribution. For me, sorry to catch off, is that it's really okay. sort of plaguing is that I know in Israel they have a very consistent grade and they legalize a medicinal component, but it's very consistent in, in its potency. And we, we're all over the board here. We have no way to, doctors have no way to prescribe it in any consistent format. And that's where the big, that's where the big hole is here. How do we get a consistent prescription so we can actually prescribe this shit? You know, in Israel, in some ways, it's it's not as far along as in the United States, right? because it's more recent that the government has okayed medical marijuana. They've been long at the forefront of scientific research into cannabis and using single molecules from the plant for therapeutic purposes or investigating them. The Israelis have been at the forefront of this whole international scientific community, at least initially, and now it's in so many countries. Young, brilliant young scientists are engaged in this area, uh, including uh, quite a strong group at the University of Washington, actually. Again, they're not working with cannabis, they're working with compounds in cannabis that are synthesized in that, or they're tweaking, you know, all, they're, they're doing amazing things, but if, as long as they can get, uh, do it without the herb, because the government doesn't allow the herb for research. Oh, most of my years I smoked without medicinal purpose. Now that I gave it up for about 10 years, now that I have the need to smoke it, it's amazing benefit that I receive every so often that I do smoke it. I'm also diabetic and I can't control my, my sweets consumption when I do smoke, so it really throws me off. This, you know? uh, <laughs> this, this compound I mentioned, uh, cannabidiol, CBD, has shown really great promise for di uh, diabetics. Wonderful. They did experiments with mice in Israel. These can't always be translated to humans, but a lot of time, you know, it's a good pointer, where they would, it, they would, would they create, they create a disease model of a certain condition, so it, disease model, well, they induce diabetes in mice, and they take half the mice, uh, before they uh, induce it, they give them this CBD, or it might be after, and they, they find out that the 
the ones who are exposed to CBD either before or after, or whatever is, is part compared to the ones who aren't, the, the onset of diabetes is much lower, or it's much they don't develop as much in many cases. So things like this are going on that, that we show. So it's worth looking to CBD if you, if you could find it a, it's, a strain it's that would have it in it. See, the Israelis, though, they just got their first high CBD strain. It went around the world recently as a news story. It's kind of funny because I, I know the guys who are doing that. Right. They didn't mean to have a news story like that. They made like they invented this thing. You know, it, there's a strain that's really high in CBD and really low in THC. It's called Canatonic.